let you guys in. Okay, so I'm going to lay down some ground rules before we begin. As much as the Michael Jackson allegations are quite polarizing, each side of the spectrum has the right to their opinion or beliefs. I have the right to believe Robson and Safechuck are telling the truth. As much as an MJ fan has the right to believe that uh, Michael Jackson is innocent and Safechuck and Robson are untrue. The Zoom event is just a discussion and not an attempt to make Jackson defenders believe he's guilty or to make victim supporters believe he's innocent. It's just a discussion where both sides of the spectrum can be respectfully heard. Um, if any participant, and that's on either side, becomes disruptive or verbally abusive, they will be booted from the meeting. All right. So, um, but I don't even know how many um, MJ supporters there are in here. I think it's mostly just um, people are on the side of um, the victims or believing the allegations. Do we have any MJ supporters in here? I would consider myself one. You're a supporter. That's fine. That's fine. Just want to make sure that, you know, everybody's heard and, and whatnot. Okay. So I guess the first talking point is going to be what made you believe Michael Jackson was guilty and how much did the Leaving Neverland documentary contribute to that view? So that's for uh, victim supporters first, but I'm going to, I have questions for both sides. All right. So who wants to take up that one first um, uh, among the victim supporters? What made you believe Michael Jackson was guilty and how much did the Leaving Neverland documentary um, contribute to that view? So you guys can raise hand. There's a raise hand function so that I can see who wants to go first. Any takers on that question? Anybody um, want to go that the supporters first? Or? Uh, yeah, yeah the, well, this is a question more for supporters since it's like, what made you feel that he was guilty and how much did the Leaving Neverland oh, documentary influence that? So, but I have questions for the MJ, the MJ oh, supporters. Okay, okay, so I believe he's guilty, so should I answer that? Or? Sure, well, okay, well, um, Z has his hand up first and then we'll, okay. we'll go to you, Venetia. Right. So Z, take it away. What made you, what was the turning point? Um, really quick, uh, hi, hi everybody, how's everybody doing, I'm Z. Um, uh, my turning point was uh, had something to do with leaving Neverland. I think that before that, I kind of got caught up in the R. Kelly stuff. And I said that, um, you know, I have to look at these things a little more seriously because I know that when it comes to celebrities, everybody thinks that celebrities are completely innocent. And, you know, they, they, they always say we never did it. We never did it. I said, how can I look at this with an unbiased eye? So I, I, I did digest leaving Neverland and I took it for what it was and I started digging around and I opened myself up to all the information. For me, it was the, uh, the ability to watch the Latoya Jackson interviews and fact check the things that she said. There was a lot of stuff that she said that was actually pretty accurate. And I know it was a time during that period because I remember watching the Latoya real-time interviews and people saying, oh, she's lying, she's after money, she's all these things. But it was a time where people just didn't like believing black women. There were Robin Givens, there was Tawana Broadley, Anita Hill, all these black women who came up with allegations and people didn't want to believe them and they were trying to do the right thing. So I, I, I re-digested what Latoya said and that's what changed my mind because a lot of the stuff she said was actually ended up being factual. She's changed her story now, but you can't, you know, you can't like take that away. You can't put that genie back in the bottle. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So that's what made me say, okay, I, 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 I definitely looked at this wrong as a child, but now as an adult with adult eyes, um, I took a more responsible approach and made it where it should be about protecting children. And that should be people's perspective. So taking that approach made me realize that, yeah, we got, we, we missed something there. A lot of people missed something. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. Well, first of all, most of us um, in this, the millennial generation would have been around 11, 12 years old when the first allegations happened in 93, right? And it's interesting that you mentioned Latoya 
because she was really the first person to even come out to say that Joe Jackson was abusive in some form, right? Because the first time Michael Jackson mentions that Joe Jackson was abusive was um, in 93, which was well after she first came out with the allegations that Joe Jackson was not just emotionally and physically abusive, but also sexually abusive, right? So, yeah, and watching the interviews, I missed all of that. I meant like because I didn't, I didn't even catch when I because I was about sixteen when that happened. Okay, so when I when I when I looked at it now, though, I was like, oh, she's saying she was sexually abused. So you have to kind of look at it as this is not somebody that's out for fame. This is an abuse victim trying to do the right thing. Yeah, and what and what and what the public did was shamed her mm-hmm. back into the arms of her family for you know, in my opinion. Yes. They shamed her back to her family because it's like I might as well stick with my family if the public is going to treat me like this. Because yes. she went, she was going that for a long time. Yeah, and uh, from what I read from Bob Jones, Bob Jones' um, book on Michael Jackson. So for all the, Bob Jones used to be Michael Jackson's publicist and worked from him for him even like um, close to during the the Motown times as well. And Bob Jones talked about the the relationship dynamics of that family. And uh, the relationship dynamics are pretty toxic. Ah, there it is. Yes, I have that book by Bob Jones, right? And um, I I can only imagine the kind of family dynamics Latoya was facing coming out with that, um, you know, and then, you know, because if you have no support, what do you do? Because it, it, it is not unheard of that Michael Jackson's team has even sent people to shoot, to do drive-by shootings at people who knew. So, you know, mm-hmm. who's to say that LaToya wasn't facing that kind of threat? So, Venetia, you, uh, let's let's go on to you and hear what, what you have to say about your turning point. My turning point was watching your, um, your special, like the Michael Jackson guilty. Because before that, I hadn't watched the Leaving Neverland documentary because I just thought it was like lies, and I just never gave it a thought mm-hmm. until like like your video came up in my feed. Oh, wow. You know, I was like, well, let me just look, and then I was like, wow. So he fit the profile of a pedophile, and you pointed it out with with like um, citations and everything. And I looked up those, and I'm like, wow. And I found a lot more information about like how. Like, his family didn't know. Mm-hmm. And not just to, like, support the victims, because I don't just blindly support. I just look at evidence. Like, he fits the profile of a pedophile, and he um, groomed the public, holding hands with kids in public. And I think, like, the biggest turning point was, like, looking at the relationship between these kids. Like, it's very intimate. Mm-hmm. And it's very, like, why? Why are we thinking of Michael Jackson sitting on the bed with a, a 12-year-old? And... Like, just that alone, and then be on the phone talking for hours. Like, you know, it's just, come on. <laughs> I just don't know how anybody's able to defend that anymore. And I did end up watching a documentary after that, and it just, it was so disgusting. And it, uh, yeah, they're very believable. So, yeah, that was that's my turning point. Yeah, I, I'm ama- I'm really glad that one of my videos helped in the, in the, in the turning point, because yeah, my turning point was was leaving Neverland, but I'll tell you something. Um before that, I didn't really know what what I would think is that I used to think is that Michael Jackson's just extremely eccentric. He's weird, dresses weird, and this is more like a witch hunt. But when I actually kind of broke down this eccentric uh, eccentricism, right? When um I made that video profile of a pedophile that was when I started seeing all this research on pedophiles. I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy is not just weird or eccentric. He has the behavior of a child predator. So I did not know that. One of the biggest things that really um, changed it for me too, um, in, in terms of making that video about profile of a, of a pedophile, something I never knew about, something called emotional congruence with children. Right. And that's a term that's a psychological um, term used with child predators um, that, you know, not only, you know, not only is just Michael Jackson, just but his 
way of connecting with children, his childlike qualities, the way that he loves video games and playing with super soakers and, you know, all that. I, I, I just saw it as an eccentricism, but what it really was, was this childlike um, immaturity that made him gravitate to children. And that's something that's like a huge red flag for child predators. Did not know that when I saw that, my mind was blown because I was like, mm, you know, that's so weird. But now it, 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 it makes sense. Let me check the chat um, for what MJ's uh, put in there. MJ Mythbuster says, I believed it when I read J. Randy Tarabarelli's biography. Coming from someone who previously had been trying to pick through the BS, I found some of Jackson's behaviors unveiled in his bio to, real, to be really scummy. Made me realize that his public PR was a facade. He could be childish, manipulative, and coming from somebody who knew MJ and was familiar with his inner circle, I found Tara Borelli's book to be quite eye-opening, even though he believes he was innocent. I had been familiar with the Bashir documentary and Leaving Neverland prior to that, but back then I fell into the rabbit hole that Jackson was a misunderstood victim. His fans can be very persuasive. However, Tara Borelli's biography is actually pretty fair and rather critical of the guy. It reveals another side to him. That's when I decided to start looking through the other side of things. Sex abuse experts and journalists. Basically, non-biased experts who are professionals in the industry um, who know what they're talking about. Your videos and other pro-guilty websites help me too. The evidence, or at least circumstantial evidence, accumulates quite overwhelmingly and damningly. Thank you, MJ Mythbuster. You know what? Yeah, the Randy Tara Borelli book is pretty telling because when I made that, that video about uh, Michael Jackson's marriages and that chapter, he, uh, Tara Borelli talks about where he and Lisa are supposedly fighting or quarreling. Lisa's telling him, please don't go on another vacation with these kids. You make it look weird. You're making me look weird you know, don't do it. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to go on vacation with the Casio brothers. Right. And when I saw that, I was like, wow, because this is look, making him look bad, even though Tara Borelli is trying to paint him in the light as somebody who he had a, a connection with children, but he, um, you know, he wasn't a pedophile. But when you look at this, that, you know, even Lisa was saying, Hey, you're making me look bad. Can you not go on vacation with these kids? Right? I was like, wow, this is this is pretty telling. This is pretty <clears throat> telling. Um, let me see. York, I don't want you to, to get left out since you're um, an MJ supporter. Let's look at, okay. Um, I, I have questions for you. First of all, okay. okay. So uh, for MJ, but, but first of all, York, do you have anything to say about that particular question? Um, um, when it comes to the Living Neverland uh, documentary, I watched it. And uh, I mean, it seemed pretty, you know, pretty graphic. And, uh, um, you know, it, it did make me think about, like, maybe Michael Jackson doing this, all these things to these kids. And it made me, you know. Uh, sick to my stomach, but um, I'm, I mean, I've always felt like it was lies, and you know, the fans on Twitter they were saying that they found like some sort of uh, uh, so like in the documentary they said some things that didn't actually happen, like for example, the train station and all that stuff, and they started like you know, demo, you know, these this, uh, stories, and uh, I, I was like, okay maybe maybe they are telling lies but then i watch your videos and i'm like oh this is like more deep into you know the psychology of how maybe a predator or a child predator thinks and how he behaves and how he you know um uh basically makes a child feel secure or feel like oh you're the best for me and then uh after that he just basically uh takes advantage of the child and I was like, oh, that made me, you know, maybe uh, see Michael Jackson from a different perspective. 
but I also watched like a few days ago, not too long ago, because they just released it, like the documentary about the Nickelodeon people. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I also oh, saw I like that. some like when Drake was talking about like this guy who abused him. Uh, he pointed out like how he was being groomed by this guy, and most of the stuff that he talked about uh, were stuff that basically the people at Living Neverland were saying that Michael Jackson did to them. And I was like, okay, maybe it's true. But then I was like, um, how is it possible that this guy who basically, you know, molested or basically raped Drake was able to not, you know, like how Nickelodeon was able to put that all, all of that evidence under the rug, yet Michael Jackson paid for silence mm-hmm. and his face was everywhere. Everyone knew about it. So that makes me think that it was more like a plot to, you know, destroy him. Because, like, how is it possible that Nickelodeon was able to get away with it for years? It was never on the news. It was just, like, an article, and that's it. No one heard about it. But Michael Jackson paid $20 million for silence, and he was still, and still is known as a, you know, as a molester. Mm-hmm. And, like, that's just something that just doesn't add up. But as you said... And as that other person said, I cannot defend him because it's impossible to defend someone that says, oh, I, you can just leave your kid and allow him to sleep next to me or like allow him to sleep in my bed and stuff like that. But, you know, that is what makes me still believe that there might be some innocence to it. And uh, or I mean, yeah, that it might just be fabrication, you know. So that's why I'm still a supporter, but I re- I'm really hoping that, you know, all the points and everyone uh, talking here would maybe, you know, change my perspective on it. And, uh, yeah, you know, I, that's why I joined. <laughs> sure, absolutely. And it's still relatable. First of all, it is absolutely your right to believe that Michael Jackson could be innocent after all he was acquitted. And I have to say, before leaving Neverland and all from the very first time that I heard when I was 11 years old, 12 years old and stuff, I did think it was kind of a witch hunt. So it's still possible to think that way, especially since Michael Jackson, when it comes to even uh, maybe his sexual orientation or his gender identity, um, a, a lot of people like that um, are automatically viewed as predators um, when they're not. So it is definitely understandable for some people who are are still, you know, I'm not sure or, you know, I think this is a witch hunt and he's being um, victimized because of his gender expression or his uh, sexual orientation or the fact that he's just eccentric. So it is relatable. So, Venetia, go ahead. I just wanted to um, ask him because it sounds like Jork MV is on a fence about, like, with all the evidence and everything. But, and I know that, um, like, maybe not everything is accurate, but I just, I'm like, how do you help, how do you explain, like, all the other evidence? Though? Because, like, one thing, type thing common with defenders is to point out, like, inaccuracy. Like, oh, the door was locked, but then it was unlocked. So I know, like, okay, I'm a therapist. I, I have to take my information down. I'm a therapist, but I know that with trauma, like, they may not remember exactly all the exact details and i think it's kind of unfair to jump on one detail like that when there's so much other evidence like how do you explain the profiling they have pictures and i mean if it's so innocent that he's in the bed with these boys like in your video why only a boy that look a certain way why not boys who are obese or black kids or you know he has a type Mm -hmm. or he had a type so i was just like I mean, if you can help me understand, like, how, like, how you can hear the evidence and see it and see that it fits, but then stop, not believe it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, right, and, I interject a minute? Oh, sure. Go ahead. See. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the, here's my problem. It's just that, first of all, we have a love affair with celebrity, right? We are, we are so in love with celebrity 
that we feel that they can do no wrong. We feel that they, we feel we are, we feel what they are, what their art exposes them to be. And they're, and they're not. They're not always that, you know? And that's how people miss clues. And there's people who choose to make a cognizant choice to ignore data, ignore clues, ignore red flags, you know? I mean, I try to, and, 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 and Venetia, I, I, I love your perspective because I try to simplify it when I talk to people. I say, no innocent man is going to pay off. You know, I have a moral record paying at least three families. I have a moral record pleading the Fifth Amendment in the court when asked these sexually abused kids. No innocent man is going to do that and keep on sleeping with kids. You know, it's, it's, it's like people want to make these very minute things problems and right. when they like when we talk about the train station is that like okay if you watch that scene he not only mentions the train station you have to tell me okay let's say the train station they should didn't live there there was an indian reservation on that uh a native american reservation on that on that property there was a uh, there was another house there were all these other places where he said the abuse took place so if you're just gonna harp on a train station then you have to explain to me why these other places he mentioned why they didn't have abuse there. You know, I, it's it, it, it's 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 definitely a grooming that Michael Jackson did because he was the most popular person in the world. You know, I don't and you know he might be the most popular person since the like the Pope or Jesus Christ. It's kind of one of those things. You know, and, and, and people just don't want to believe it. And he played that role like I'm the victim of a of a brash media. I'm the victim of jealousy, I'm a victim of envy, I'm a victim of all these things, I'm a victim of abusive father, I am the victim and I didn't do anything wrong here. And in actuality, all it, all it did was cover up and the music with all these particular messages, with all these particular messages in the music, you're like, oh, he can't possibly do that. He sang this song, he sang that song. It doesn't work that way. It absolutely doesn't work that way. Let me read what MJ Mythbuster says. Precisely, mm -hmm. she called him the O. Oh. You're talking about uh, Lisa Marie. Precisely, she called him the most selfish person she'd ever met. I don't think it's a case of conspiracy or cover-up. It's a case of MJ being the biggest star in history. The media are naturally going to cover that story and milk it for all it's worth. That's true. Because it gets them a lot of attention and makes them big money. Um, yeah, you know what, too? I would say that not only was Michael Jackson the hugest celebrity on the planet. He really was. And there hasn't been a celebrity like that since. But right. Michael Jackson, I think, really played with the heartstrings of a lot of people with the messages he was constantly... He was a humanitarian, right? Constantly involved with the... Uh, like, even... I can't remember the name of the guy who... who <clears throat> there's another British guy that's... Uh, was involved in humanitarian work like that. But basically he, he had a lot of humanitarian efforts, you know, that he, he did the Heal the World Foundation and the songs that he came out with, such powerful, men. I mean, I loved those. Man in the Mirror, Heal the World, We Are the World, um, and more Earth Song. So those are very powerful. And I can see how a fan can you know, be attached to him, not just because he's a big celebrity, because we have lots of celebrities, but we don't have celebrities that really focus so much on a message of compassion, love, you know, the world, we need to change the world. It was very, these powerful messages. And then you see him in the media all the time in these hospitals and orphanages and, you know, with this big check to the Heal the World Foundation. And you really... I wouldn't blame anybody who believed that about him. And, you know, he has a duplicity about him because I think he genuinely did love doing things for children, but then it was mixed into this perversion that he thought, okay, well, in my view, if Michael Jackson is guilty, I think that maybe he thought that having a romantic relationship with a child was just another way of expressing love. So, but I can totally see how somebody could look at that and say, no, Michael Jackson could never have done these things because look at the powerful message in his music. Look at how much 
humanitarian work. This man de dedicated his life to children. And then he invited kids from the inner city and, and to come to Neverland. So I can definitely see how somebody could say, no, there's no way this man could have done this because look at how powerful this message is. So I, I do, I do um, um, under, understand that. Um, there is another thing I was going to say, but let, let's move on to this. We can get back to it, though. Um, there's another, I have a few talking points here. So if you, okay, so this is for uh, MJ supporters. So if you at one point thought Michael Jackson was innocent, oh no, wait, it's not, it's, it's for, um, if you at one point thought Michael Jackson was innocent and now believe he's guilty, what was a turning point for you? No, that's the same thing. Like we just talked about that. Okay, so everybody, what impact do you think the Me Too movement of 2017 had on society's willingness willingness to believe persons like Wade and Jimmy? So anybody want to take that? The Me Too movement, what has it really done? Me personally, um, I think it's... Uh, the Me Too movement have been has been critical because for me, before the Me Too movement happened, I just kind of assumed that, you know, professionals were professionals. There were no quid pro quos. There's no dark CD underbelly. Everything is as it seems. And then the Me Too movement basically exploded that idea. We found out about Harvey Weinstein, Jeffrey Epstein, Bill Cosby, and finding out these people that a lot of people put their faith in, especially Bill Cosby, as like this, you know, this bastion of ethics and morality standing up for the African-American community. And now to find out that things are not the way you think, you know, um, that really changed me. I had a more willingness to see, wait a minute. Not everything is as it seems, apparently. There's a dark and seedy underbelly. So, Z, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think the Me Too movement really set a precedent that, okay, we missed a lot of clues. We missed a lot of things. It's time to start taking these things seriously because we, we can say we live in a culture that doesn't believe in abuse. We can say we live in a uh, culture that doesn't believe in preying on innocent victims and taking advantage of people because they want an opportunity. We can say all that because everybody will say it exists, but they never point it out. And we missed a lot of clues and then we ignore people because, well, we judge them based on fame. We judge them based on money they have. You know, we, and, that, and that allows us, that, that enables us to miss clues, that enables us to, to miss these things. The, miss, the Me Too movement had a huge role in this because you have to listen to the people. You have to digest what they're saying before you can just outright say, oh, they're out for money. Oh, they're out for opportunity. Oh, they're out for this. And you haven't listened to a word they said. People have to listen to people. Mm -hmm. They have to listen. And that's where that's where the Me Too movement has been essential in this because now you realize it's not just Wayne and it's not just James. This list, this list could end up being pretty long. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how many people are out there being quiet about this because they were so romanticized with them that they just feel compelled to protect them. It's much bigger than these two. And that's what we need to take from these. I agree. I, I agree a lot. I think the list of victims is probably very, very long. This man had a very uh, long standing career and was going to all these different countries. And, you know, I know people like to poo poo people like uh, Michael Jacobs Hagen. And things, but th these are just one of the, you know, the random kids that this right. man um, could have gone into. And 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 something you mentioned too, Z, that's very important, is that the Me Too movement allowed persons who did not have a lot of fame, you know, these voices now were put front and center, you know, because yeah, if you even look at Latoya Jackson, people will say, oh, she's a black sheep, she's a weirdo, right? She's a little mental. Why should we pay any attention to her? And the people who are powerful in Hollywood and the entertainment industry, the music industry, these are the ones whose voices are heard first. But the Me Too movement really changed that to say, look, there, there are people who have been victimized. And no, they're not, they're not um, you know, 
famous actresses like Gwyneth Paltrow, even though she eventually did lend her voice to the movement. These are unknowns, right. but it's finally getting the voices of the unknowns, you know, front and center. I didn't know who Wade Robson was, you know. I didn't yeah, know I, I, that, that was one of my shocks. Is like because I remember Wade as a kid. I remember so um, Wade was in the videos, and then he did this thing for NBA All Star Weekend. So he danced there with Paul Abdul, and I remember him from that. Wow. And when I remember him, I said, "Okay, I really have to take this seriously because." This is a kid who built his reputation off of being friends with Michael Jackson. Like, mm-hmm. I know that's his story. I know that's what he does when he talks about dancing with Britney Spears and NSYNC. He always mentioned his relationship with Michael Jackson always came up. Mm-hmm. So when people start talking about he's not credible, he spent a lot of time with Michael Jackson. And it's 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 pretty obvious he did, you know? And, and if he's telling this story and we know that these accusations are out here... We have to take him seriously. I don't. I don't see. I can't. People can't just tell me like, no, you can't take him seriously. Why not? Why not? Exactly. Why mm-hmm. not? Because they're making the same argument. I mean, with this Pity thing going on, right? It's the same thing. Oh, these people are out for a money grab. Pity is yeah. innocent. These are ridiculous charges, and um, the 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 government and the feds are just victimizing another black man. Right? No, you know, this is this is a similar uh, argument made. No, oh, you know, it's just a money grab. See, they don't have that much money. But finally, the Me Too movement is, is allowing people um, to have their voices heard who aren't powerful. Mm. Uh, let me read something yeah. from MJ uh, Mythbuster here. It says, the behavior of the 90s and early 2000s media certainly didn't help the situation at the time. MJ was able to weaponize that suspicion of the press. He was a notorious critic of the tabloids, eerily similar to certain figures nowadays. The media will do what they will do for ratings and money, etc. But they have real people working for them who are trying to uncover the truth. Very true. He also contributed to stuff that the media said about him because he gave them stuff to say about him. (laughs) Exactly. The elephant man's phone. He deliberately and Jay Randy Tarabarelli puts that in the in the um, autobi- in the biography that Michael Jackson would deliberately put in. It, it, it's a ma- it's a masterful dupe play. <laughs> it's a masterful duping of the public. It's a uh, that's what this well, this that's what this is. It's like how do you look back at it and say, "Yo, we were all duped. We have to we have to own that." Manipulate, yeah. definitely. And MJ Mythbuster says. Regarding Me Too, people started realizing that this is more prominent and widespread than originally believed, especially among huge industries, and also listening to just how hard it is for survivors to come forward. And Venetia says there are 11 who said something publicly but weren't believed. Is that with the Me Too movement, uh, Venetia? Um, And let's see. And... If people I don't think it was a Me Too movement, but it was just sort of starting back from the 80s. Sorry, I had to read my hand, but starting from the 80s, there was um, the, the rubber, rubber friend yes. and the one with the milk. They all said these things, but it was just brushed aside. Mm-hmm. How ironic, too, because we know we only started knowing about these, um, these nicknames, you know, that Wade, that, that was the first time yeah. I was hearing stuff about Applehead and Doodoo Head. And things like and that. Rubber, yeah. And rubber, rubber. I have, uh, I have uh, Emmanuel Lewis. I haven't called a rubber. I have a video of him calling Emmanuel Lewis rubber. Oh um, wow! At, at the awards, I have a video of it. Yeah. Oh my gosh! I, no sense. I've done very. I've done. I've, I've done. I've, I've tried to dig to make sure I got all the information, and I literally cannot unsee the no, things I've seen. seen. Oh no. And, Right, and and, I'm, and it's like, and I real, and I, I believe this goes so much deeper than we really know, but it's already bad on the surface, you know. It's very bad on the surface. But all those nicknames, mm-hmm. is is clear, and even when you read the court testimony, it, the, the names are in the court testimony. Yes, uh, York says Corey Feldman defends him, and he calls out pedos in in Hollywood. Actually, Corey Feldman turned. Um, so at first, Corey Feldman. Defended Michael Jackson said Michael Jackson never victimized him and I believe Corey Feldman uh, But then after a time Corey Feldman said I can no longer Defend Michael Jackson because he just 
doesn't know anymore. So at first, Corey Feldman believed him. And back when um, the Martin Bashir documentary happened, he actually went on AB. Corey Feldman has flip-flopped a lot. So at first, he's like, no. Then he's like, yes. Then he's like, no. Because back when yeah. Martin Bashir came out with that documentary, he had a follow-up documentary called um, The Secret World of Michael Jackson. And he interviewed Corey Feldman. And Corey Feldman was like, listen, actually, there are some things Michael did that I I just, those are really creepy. And he said how um, he, he had a book, Michael Jackson had a book that he showed Corey Feldman when he was only 13 years old that had like pictures of naked people with venereal diseases and he's flipping through this book and Corey Feldman now he's an adult when Martin Bashir is interviewing him but he's like if I knew that a man had taken my 13 year old son and was showing him pictures like that to quote Corey Feldman Corey Feldman said I would probably beat his ass so that's what Corey yeah. Feldman said <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I um, I saw. I, I also have an audio of, of Corey Feldman attacking Latoya Jackson. I don't know if anybody's heard of this, but interesting. When he, yeah, when Latoya first uh, was talking about Michael, he called. He called into the radio station, and they were arguing back and forth. And like, no, Corey, he wasn't attracted to you. He didn't like you. He was like, oh God, why don't we go home? And Corey says a lot of clues that people should take seriously because Corey saying. You and Michael were like best friends, which she says that she was the closest to Michael. Mm -hmm. And when, when we digest what she says, it's like, no, she was definitely the closest to Michael. She, her and Michael stayed at the house together longer than all the other brothers and sisters. Yes. So these are all clues that, that keep making her credible on this. Yeah, yeah, quite, quite tragic that she's turned her uh, story. But of course, you know, for her, she may not be safe. Um, you know, uh, saying what she's, especially being a Jackson, especially being so close to the family. It's you, yeah, you have to look at it. You have to look at it like this. The world, the world tore her down. She was being beaten by her husband. It's like, if I'm going to put up with this kind of abuse from the world, trying to do the right thing, why not go back to my family and why not stand in solidarity with them? Because at least there's some sort of love there. The public had no love with Latoya Jackson. Wilson Phillips was talking bad about her. Queen Latifah talked bad about her. all these famous people get on TV and say some of the various things about her. And they were, and you look back at now, it's like she was telling the absolute truth. She told us about Blanca Francia before it, before it came out. Mm -hmm. You know, she she told us about Jimmy St. Chuck long before they even accused him. Like these things are clues now. We look like we should, people should be like, "Oops, we really mistreated an abuse victim who was trying to do the right thing." It's so sad, too, because, you know, Latoya has gone through so much victimization. She probably has a lot of psychological issues as well. And that's what's making it hard for, you know, easy for people to just discredit her and say she's just a messed up Jackson. Don't believe her. Venetia, go ahead. I just wanted to say, like, Latoya, I'm not sure if I have on my back straight, but I believe that she never recanted about her brother. She just said, um... No, she never recanted about her dad. Okay, I can't remember. But I've never yeah, seen her she, come she out. Around, she talks. She kind of talks around it. She never like yeah, definitively she said. See the same the same vigor that she told on him. She does not do it now mm -hmm. with the same vigor or the same aggression. She's like, I'm trying to protect innocent kids. She's very direct when she's saying these things. But you know, but she, even when Barbara walks his ass, and she's like, Michael is not. Yes. It's not what? <laughs> not what? Not what? He is not. Because you got on you yeah. entertainment tonight, and he's like, you calling your brother a pedophile? Yes. You know? it's it, You see that, and it's just kind of like, she she knows those dark stories in Hollywood. She knows, she, so, so do, does anyone know that Latoya talked to the district attorney about Michael? Yes. Yes, she did. Okay. Right, yes. Yeah, yes. so you can't put that back in the, in the, in the genie bottle either. Yeah. Nobody's just going to sit up here and make up a story and say, let's talk to the district attorney. And the date that was on that was September 2nd, 1993, right? Mm -hmm. So for those next two, three months, she defended Michael. And then she did the press conference in Israel where she came out and said that. Yes, exactly. So her being, her, her, because I, I do believe, I definitely believe that she was abused by Jack Gordon. And I believe he was horrific to her. 
uh, because he wanted to keep the upper hand and not lose the money because they were getting good money till Michael paid off Jordan Chandler. Then things slowed down for them. But um, she can't put all that back in the bottle now. She can't. She can say that, but like it's like no, we're like no, Latoya, you're lying now. Let's um let's uh, look at the chat. MJ Mythbuster says, not to mention the fact that these kids and their families, especially in the case of Gavin Arvizo, were helped a lot by Jackson. I find it hard to believe that so many people would just stab their friend in the back and try to throw him in prison for money. Yes, exactly. That's another thing I, I thought about. That goes for his staff members too. <coughs> Excuse me. 10 staff members from Jackson's inner circle have alleged suspicious behavior too. Jackson knew what he was doing when it came to the media. All right, and let's see. Oh, we lost somebody. Oh, we lost Venetia. Hopefully she'll come back in. Um, York, is there anything uh, anything you want to put in there? Or Wingtech, we haven't heard from you. I haven't seen you is in the mic on? Yes, your mic is on. Oh, there you go. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm just waiting for, I don't know. And you can use the raise hand function as well. Okay. All right, go ahead. Um. Yeah, I, I believe that MJ was innocent for a long, long time because I didn't want to believe that, you know, if, if, like a crime like that, that's like, first of all, I'm, I'm going to put it like this because um, I have a very unique outlook on, on this situation because I, I did start to believe he's guilty recently. Um, based off of looking at short videos, and it really like made me think like, damn, like this dude really look like you know what you know what I mean? Like if it quacked like a duck, you know that type of stuff. And then certain information I had not known before, but um, even like when I started to think or believe he was guilty, the one thing about it is I still is. It, it's mental illness. Like I deal with mental illness because I have severe ADHD all my life. And it's like, there's a misconception when it comes to mental illness, like of how it looks on the surface. And then there's the actual reality of it. And I say that to say like pedophilia, like I always looked at it as like, cause you know, I used to be in, into the videos of people getting caught and, that shit would intrigue me. So mm -hmm. I used to always wonder, like, well, damn, how do they keep you getting caught? Or how can't they, like, how can you make a dumb decision like this? And you know what I'm saying? Like, how is, I used to think it was a choice. Like, I used to think they just did it because they made a choice to do it. You know, it's, some weird it's, shit. It's, but. A, it's, a, it's an addiction, Wing Tech. It's an addiction. It's an absolute addiction. Because they once they once they get into it, they can't stop it themselves. Um, and even getting caught, it's like the the fear of getting caught and risking everything doesn't right. doesn't even scare them, like not one bit. Like the fact that Michael was able to pay off Jordan Chandler and it went away because as soon as he paid him, you know, he made a public he made one public appearance and then he was married to Lisa Marie Presley, and that was right. the news. They was like, "Is nobody going to ask this dude like what's <laughs> going on with this payoff? What was this all about?" It totally went under the road. Yeah, I was. Yeah, he, he was not scared at all. Yeah, when I was looking at the behaviors of pedophiles, it really seems like this addictive behavior that's very difficult to control. I mean, uh, I know that, like, in one of my last videos, I did say that um, there are communities of pedophiles, of what it, minor attracted people, that do. You know, they look for help, they get support, and, you know, in that way, they are able to not offend or victimize a child. But it looks like they have to put a lot of work in because, you know, there's all, Michael Jackson's, well, according to the, the evidence that they found against him, the kind of books that were in his house with um, kind of masochistic things, it, it seems like there was also some kind of, sex addiction issue as well with Michael Jackson. It wasn't just an attraction to kids. It was like this um, this obsession, right? That At least that's 
that's that's what I'm I'm seeing. Let's move on to mm -hmm. um, another talking point. This is going to be a a delicate t talking point. Are there any CSA survivors in the house? When I mean CSA, I mean child sexual abuse survivors. <coughs> Excuse me. Why do you feel that most victims of CSA don't disclose their abuse until well into adulthood? I'm a CSA survivor, guys, so I want to kind of normalize talking about this, but totally do not feel pressured if you're not ready to disclose or, you know, whatever. So, but yeah, that question is out. Uh, why do you feel that most victims of CSA don't disclose their abuse until well into adulthood? Any takers on that? I personally, well, I'm, not a, I'm not a child, uh, a sexual abuse survivor, but I, can, I would love to you speak. You can still, you can still, because yeah, yeah cause I've had, I, I've had some people who've just been victims of abuse. Period. That kind of opened up to me, uh, because that's the one thing I think that's uh, the best thing about all of this. I've really learned what having grace for victims truly means now. Mm -hmm. And uh, and 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 when I and, and I know it's important to them to listen because the worst thing that you can ever do is somebody want to tell you that stuff and you reject them. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. When I I'll tell so I'm going to share a secret with everybody. Um, so when I was in high school, R. Kelly tried to sneak in my high school, um, and my dean of students put him out because um, he didn't have a pass to be there. He didn't have clearance to be there, and he wasn't caught up in his celebrity. And that's part of my crusade now is because I know I know today that my dean of students saved a lot of kids that day, right? And I can't be caught up in celebrity if I really want to get this right. Because R. Kelly went to numerous other schools around Chicago and he was able to get in and have talent shows, have auditions, and get these girls to come back to his studio. And I don't want to be the person that says, hey, if I have a chance to protect the child, then I shouldn't miss it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So all it's done is kind of heightened my awareness for it. It's increased my, my sensitivity for it. And back then in that time, because Chicago's high schools were very bad with pedophiles coming out and hanging out at the schools, especially gang members who felt like nobody was going to to charge them up about it. Mm -hmm. They would they would these girls were going with these guys right into their parents' noses. Some of these parents were like kind of signing it off. I, I would see the behaviors and how the other parents would get tripped up. And I saw it in those parents. And those kids who don't say nothing about it probably don't want to embarrass their parents. Mm -hmm. Probably are afraid that their parents are going to be hurt or shamed or might become disappointed. And I think that's a huge reason why a lot of people don't say anything because they do want to protect people who might have known and could have done something, but didn't. Because those people would feel extremely guilty if they would know. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. Well, I can tell you that me personally, the Me Too movement allowed me, emboldened me to be able to confront my abuser, right? Um, before that, I was probably going to take it to the grave. <laughs> you know, if I didn't see other people standing up, and when I saw them standing up and the, the things that they... They talked about, I was like, wait a minute, but this person did that, right? And then I was able to, uh, you know what? Like also a friend who was like, cause I was even willing to laugh off their behavior. I was like, do you believe he did this? <laughs> right? But then my friend was like, what? You know, I would never do that to X, Y, Z, right? And I was like, I knew it. I knew something was wrong. I knew something was wrong. But like the Me Too movement really helped me because yeah, I'm pretty sure I would have taken it to the grave, except now I felt, <coughs> excuse me, emboldened. And I'm like, wait a minute, if this is considered sexual harassment, then I've experienced that, right? And this is wrong. And this is wrong for this person to do that, right? And certainly my friend coming to my friend and not saying, oh, that's not so bad. and. You know, at least this didn't happen or whatever, which is usually what I the, the response I would get like, oh, you're and you're lucky. You're lucky. You should be grateful, blah, blah, blah. Right. And so. So, yeah, I really have to say the Me Too movement helped me a lot um, in terms of like but she said he did that. And that's exactly what happened to me. 
right? So that emboldened me a lot. But I was in my 30s. I was like 36, right? Before mm -hmm. I, because when you're a child, at least for me, I knew that, first of all, most people don't believe me anyway, right? Because you're a child, yeah. right? And here's Carson trying to come back in again. We had the person and we lost them. So, but yeah, like, you know, as a child, you're not really believed much anyway. Uh, and Carson, um, what we're talking about uh, right now is uh, why do you feel most victims of child sexual abuse don't disclose their abuse until adulthood? So I'm, I'm given my experience. So yeah, basically this person is very, the, my um, abuser was very powerful professionally, socially, monetarily. So I was afraid if I tell anybody, right, they're going to say, you know, how could you, this person is, you know, a, this person and, and whatnot, you know, like, oh, you know, you're ungrateful. You're, you know, and, and you're the sick one, right? That's what I was afraid of when I was a child. So I did not get the, the courage to confront my abuser about anything until the Me Too movement and until having that friend who said, that behavior is not normal. That behavior is not normal. So like for me, that, that allowed me, but I was 36 the first time. Right. Okay. So mm -hmm. for MJ fans, so York <laughs> and anybody else, um, for MJ fans who believe he's innocent, how do you think the leaving Neverland documentary fails to show Michael Jackson as a predator? Any takers on that? How does the Leaving Neverland documentary fail to show Michael Jackson as a predator? You know, I, I looked at, um, I look, I can't remember what video it was, but it was a Michael Jackson supported video. And it did say that, okay, when you're watching Leaving Neverland, you're watching all these videos of Jimmy Safechuck hand in hand with Michael Jackson, dancing with him on stage. You're seeing... Uh, Wade Robson, you know, in videos or on stage with Michael Jackson, you're seeing all these videos, but the, the, the video then said, but when it came to him abusing these kids, you have no video, no evidence, no nothing. Right. So that's the argument. But, um, what I've been told, um, by persons who work in the criminal justice system is that, <laughs> Most times these cases, there are no, um, there are no, you know, smoking gun evidence. There are no videos. There's no soiled underwear. Um, you know, unless it was a violent rape or something like that, you're not going to have like a rape kit done with DNA. A lot of times it's a, he said, she said thing, but, um, they, if a child is very descriptive and believable, that will sway a jury. That's what I was. Um, that's what I understand from people who have worked in the criminal justice system who deal with cases of child sexual abuse by an adult, that you're not really going to have a lot of that. Um, but York, you had your hand up. Can you, can you go ahead? Yeah, I was just, uh, going to say that, um, when you watch the raid at the Neverland Ranch, the, the, the video, um, you know, in the 2005 trial, I think they put like all the evidence of like the coffee table book and all that stuff. Uh, however, in the video, I never watched or saw anyone showing those books or finding those books at Michael's house. So, I mean, the fact that they presented it as evidence, even though it wasn't included in the rating, that was kind of weird, weird for me. Yeah, the raid though, the raid was very, because that raid was very extensive. They had like 70 something different, oh, oh nice to see you in person. <laughs> <laughs> well, being shy, no problem. Hello. But, um, <laughs> that's fine. but yeah, um, the raid didn't cover everything. What it did show, um, it did show the, the sheriffs going through the Neverland Ranch going through their, you know, the arcades and stuff like that. The video did show a lot, but um, I would say that maybe they did find these things, but they just didn't put it on video. And then there's also the video that we are able to get because 
you know, the, the Santa Barbara uh, County Sheriff, they will have the full extent of the video that they talk and, uh, that they took and pictures and all that. We only get clips. You know, we only get clips of seeing the, the sheriffs walking in the bedroom and stuff like that. So there's a lot of video that we haven't seen. They probably have hours and hours and hours of video and pictures and pictures um, of, of things that they took. So, you know, I wouldn't put too much weight on the fact that you haven't seen it in the video because there's only like, I don't even know, like one of the videos I saw of the raid, it was like, I don't even know if it was 30 minutes that we even saw. You know, so I'm, I'm sure that they have a lot of things that just didn't come to the light of uh, the public before uh, the crime. There was something else I was going to mention, but I lost my thought. Let me see what MJ Defender has put in the chat. So the be all and end all for them is concrete evidence. They don't take into account the piles of circumstantial evidence in the 2003 forensic investigation. There was found to be traces of semen and blood on Jackson's mattress. However, Mesereau managed to get it turned away from being used as trial evidence because it didn't specifically prove that Jackson molested Arvizo. You can find the documents online. The traces didn't belong to Gavin Arvizo, but it didn't belong to Jackson either. Kind of makes you wonder. Oh, I did not know that there were things like traces of semen and blood. Um, on Michael Jackson's uh, one thing I, I did learn and um, this is in the in Diane Diamond's book be careful who you love um, Bla not Blanca Francia Adrian McManus said that staff were tipped off about the raids before they happened right and staff actually start before the police the, sh the, the county sheriff could come to the to the ranch there was staff just running into Michael Jackson's bedrooms and this is that, just taking tons of things, sheets, laundry, books, magazines, videotapes. Um, this is according to Adrian McManus. Adrian McManus said that they were tipped off, that people were ordered to take things from the ranch personally, take it to their homes, wherever. And we can only imagine because Adrian McManus said, that she saw when people were taking things out of Michael Jackson's bedroom, there was a picture of right. Macaulay Culkin in his underwear. And people were like, who is that? Is that Macaulay Culkin in his underwear? So there right. are a lot of things that, you know what, might have been taken off because they were tipped off. So this is according to yeah. Adrian McManus. Yeah, go ahead, Z. Uh, Bob Jones also indicated that there was somebody that was tipped off too. Because the, I believe in his book, it indicated that Michael was already going to Thailand. They saw the raid when they got to Tokyo, which they had a layover before they went to Thailand. And when we deal with these characters, because now we have to get into the circle of protection, right? So Bill Bray is former LAPD, and he has a connection there. Plus, there's Anthony Pelicano, who was tapping several phones. And uh, I got it on good authority, and even the people in the DA's office thought their phones were tapped too. Yeah. But you know, the likes of Diane Diamond and people who worked for him, all their phones were tapped. And you know, and, and people when we talk about the red flags around Michael Jackson, Anthony Pelicano and, and, and Bill Bray are huge red flags. Yes. Huge. So when they talk about a raid, you, know, you have two people who could plausibly find out that there's going to be a raid on Neverland Ranch. Yeah, definitely. And MJ Defender says, yes, exactly. Bill Bray, Jackson's head of security, I believe, worked for the LAPD and had friends and connections there. Maybe they tipped, uh, he, they tipped him off. Um, so yeah, but LAPD has a, a lot of uh, has a lot of had a lot of leaks. And even even the district attorney's office felt that there were leaks there because they didn't understand how Diane Diamond was getting all that information. Uh -huh. See, because there were plenty. There were, yeah, Michael had sources all in the police department. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm very I'm very curious as to, because I even heard that there were suitcases of pictures and videos that were taken by Anthony Pelicano. So I'm wondering, wow, mm -hmm. what kind of videos? Because, you know, Victor Gutierrez said that there was a video showing Michael Jackson abusing a minor. And he yeah, then had and, to... Go ahead. Yeah, and the FBI, the FBI had to take 
So when people bring up the FBI investigation, really it was FBI assisting local law enforcement, which is not their investigation. But there was a tape in possession of the FBI that they could not extract data from the tape. So all this talk about the tape, I've, I've always been curious, is that the tape that might have been in the hands of, of, of um, Neverland Security who apparently got this tape to Victor Gutierrez? Uh-huh. You know, because this, because the, the date on the tape is said to be December of 1994. The FBI scrubbed this one tape, it was 1995. So it's possible that that was the tape. And, you know, I, I'm learning now after reading into this, Michael Jackson didn't have any sort of code or boundary about who he abused. So it's plausible the kid that they're talking about on that tape, it's plausible that he did it because I don't even see that that, that part of the family even interacts too much with everybody else from what I can tell. Yeah, yeah. I'll see what, uh, MJ Defender says, sorry. What? Not MJ, Mythbuster, sorry. Uh, Anthony Pelicano has turned on Jackson too. In a 2011 interview, he stated that he stopped working for MJ because he found out some truths. Quote, he did worse things to kids than molest them. Oh, that's that's really, that's really crazy. Let's move on to the next talking point. For MJ fans, oh no, we, we've been, we've done that. Has anybody ever met Michael Jackson in person when he was alive? And how did that experience impact you? Has anybody, anybody ever gotten to meet King of Pop before he died? No. Nope. Yeah, I have to say. Uh, and I, I probably yeah. would have been starstruck if that ever happened. I'd be like, oh, thank you, Mr. Jackson. I'd have probably he was so, he was so elusive during that time, which is when they, you don't hear stories about you know, I think he he found himself in circles where where he could be who he was. He he didn't because he didn't go to he, he didn't go to communities around. He slide all over the world and hiding out in hotel rooms and then showing up for awards and showing up for checks. But like just hanging out with with everyday people, and, and I, I I kind of believe that that that's going to be a small a small room of people who can say that. Probably be mostly celebrities. Let me tell you, when the charges came came to the public in 1993 and in 2000, um, in 2003, right? Um, he kind of had to do some kind of a lot of publicity um, damage control. And I noticed after 1993, after the allegations, and after the 2003 Bashir documentary. He did a lot of going and visiting um, children's hospitals. He went back to Gary, Indiana, you know, and hung up. He'd never, never been back to get Gary, Indiana before the best year docu- documentary came out. He was gone. You know, he's living his life. But all of a sudden, because of the best year documentary, he's back in get Gary, Indiana, hanging out with, um, you know, economically vulnerable uh, communities and saying, yes, you know, and you know, almost like a politician, you know, making his yeah. rounds, doing his pandering, you know, to yeah. the public and saying, you know, I'm a good, he, he involved himself in so many, um, definitely after 2003 and definitely after 1993, uh, that was when too, he had a lot of inner city children from schools come to Neverland. He didn't really do that that much before, he but, did not. Uh, but trust me after 2003 and 1993, Tons of kids were, and he would invite the media. He would invite the media to come. Right. And then these parents. Because, I, the the African American community where he tried to, he didn't, he, he, I, I, like, I just don't recall him ingraining himself in the African American community like it that is. until after he got accused. You know, NAACP Awards, there was never any Michael Jackson performances. Soul Train, there was hardly yeah. There was one. So anybody seen the video of him? Uh, when he's sitting in the chair and he's dancing and they're dancing and this stuff. The okay. award show, did anybody see that? I didn't see that one. Okay, well, the, the story behind that is, is that he didn't want to, Yeah, he didn't remember the time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the story, yeah. the, the story is he didn't want to perform that night, but he had already committed to it. He just didn't feel like it, so he faked the injury so he could sit in the chair and not do anything, and people were going to, you know, 
platform or I'm aware. Because the black community was never going to turn on him. It was just not. It was just not going to happen. You know, even no matter how weird he got, no matter how strange he got, no matter how much these kids that he's taking all over the world, you know, he, like helping out R and B groups who want to come up. He didn't help them out. He, yeah. you know, hey, how you doing? And moved on. Yeah, it's it's very very strange that people didn't catch that because after you know it's he knew that that, that African American community was going to stick by him no matter what. They're not going to believe it, and that's the narrative that they can push because the NAACP start pushing that narrative. Um, a couple of other organ, black organizations start pushing that narrative. Oh, he's being tortured in the media, all this other stuff, and, then, and you can tell nobody was reading anything. Yeah, no, and um, another thing, to, I, I remember when I saw him at the BET Awards performing with James Brown, and this man was regularly snubbed the BET Awards. He was not going to be performing at, but after 2003, though, there he was on the BET yeah. Awards, dancing like he's always been a part of, oh, yes, black community, I'm with you. Right. And yeah. so, so it's like, yeah, I definitely noticed um, some damage control uh, publicity strategies that he did afterwards, after both trials, after the 1993, then that waned and then he stopped. And then 2003, back at it again, going to Gary, Indiana on BET Awards, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Let's see. <clears throat> so, yep, uh, nobody's. All right. So. Here's a question um, I want to pose to you guys. Let me see. Okay, we're gonna look at we're gonna look at a clip of Wade Robson at 11 years old uh, when he's on. Uh, let's see. Yeah, he's on CNN or something. And I I wonder if anybody can see in this child's body language that he was lying even then. I'm gonna share my video. I'm going to share my, my screen. That's what I was doing all the videos I would watch after seeing your videos. I would just look at all his interviews and all his accuser interviews and just study their body language. Like, really? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me go ahead and that's my. All right. I have Wade Robson. Oh, here we go. While a second family claiming to be friends with the energy. While a second family. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that doesn't look too good. Okay, that's a bit better. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Here we go. While a second family claiming to be friends with the entertainer was introduced to CNN late Thursday by an associate of Jackson's. As with 11 year old Brett Barnes interviewed Wednesday by CNN. Joy Robson and her two children say they frequently stayed at Jackson's ranch and that 10-year-old Wade had slumber parties with Jackson and sleeping with him in the same bed. Yeah, you know, there's been different times where it's been me and Michael. Then there'd be other times where he has other friends over too. That's what, like what Brett said, it's just a slumber party. You just have a lot of fun. And you know, I've slept in the same bed as Michael. It's just you watch cartoons, you fall asleep. You know, it's just a friendship. And I know he would never do anything to hurt my brother. He's just, he's the nicest guy you've ever met. I've been there when uh, these kids have been in Michael's room. I've been there with them. It's just party time. They watch videos, they eat junk food, they play video games. They play so hard. They fall asleep. They're exhausted. They fall asleep. There's nothing more to it than that. From your standpoint, does it seem unusual for a 34-year-old man to have kids sleeping over? Not when you know Michael's background. <clears throat> Under normal circumstances, possibly yes. But Michael, everybody knows he didn't have a childhood. While Jackson's told... All right, I'm going to stop the share. So guys, what do you guys think of that? That video? Of, uh... Uh, I watched that video and I'm very disturbed by it. Um, I'm, I'm disturbed by it because in my, in my digging, I know that when that video came out, it's been corroborated from Victor Gutierrez's book and Jermaine Jackson's book that she was told that Michael was a child molester mm -hmm. in 1992. And for her to take her son back to him, I felt was 
oh, 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 it's heartbroken. You know, yeah. I know it's hard, hard, but it's tough. We're, I definitely want to get into that with Joy Robson. That's another one of my talking points. But like, okay. one thing I can see with Wade, the difference between Wade and Chantel, right? If you look at the difference, because Chantel believes Michael Jackson is innocent. Um, Chantel has never been abused by Michael Jackson. So you see, Chantel has a slight smile on her face because she thinks this whole thing is so ridiculous. She's like, he's never done anything to me. He's never done anything to my brother. She's smiling because she thinks the whole thing is a joke. Like, this is so ridiculous. But when you see Wade, Wade's body language, oh my gosh. Like, he just looks so scared. He just looks so nervous. He's doing things like this, you know, and uh, and he just looks like worried, like, you believe me, right? I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? I'm looking at that video. Maybe when I saw it when I was 12 years old, I, I would have probably believed him, right? But you're looking back, and I just noticed the difference between Chantal and between Wade. And um, Chantal looks so relaxed. She's she's laughing. Oops, hope this doesn't fall. She's laughing, you know, because this is so ridiculous to her because I, she's never been abused by Michael Jackson. So she thinks the whole thing is ridiculous. She's a smi- she has a smile mm-hmm. on her face. But there is Wade with this, these eyes that look like a doe in headlights, you know, just, yeah, it's like what Brett said. You know, he just looks so nervous. Anybody else have that take? When they look, or York, if you or if you disagree, I'm not saying York just because I know he's the only one that I know is a Jackson supporter. But anybody look at that and think, no, I think that Wade is telling the truth and it's obvious. Anybody see that? Okay. But yeah, uh, and we're gonna get into um, we're gonna get into Joy Robson in a bit. All right. So, all right. So here's another, here's a question. This goes right into Joy Robson Z. Let's look at the concept of willful blindness. Now, according to this website, the criminal law notebook by Peter Dostal, it says willful blindness attributes knowledge to a party whose strong suspicions have been aroused but who refrains from making inquiries to have those suspicions confirmed. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines willful blindness as deliberate failure to make a reasonable inquiry of wrongdoing, such as drug dealing in one's house. Despite suspicion or an awareness, the high probability of his existence. So do you guys, you mentioned Joy Robson. Do you believe that Stephanie Safechuck Joy Robson and June Chandler were completely deceived by Jackson into thinking their children were safe? Or do you believe that because of the monetary benefits they were receiving from Jackson, that they were engaging in willful blindness? Why or why not? <coughs> so Z, if you want to start off, because you were talking about Joy. Yeah, yeah. so here's the way I see looking at those parents, I definitely believe that those parents knew something was up. Um, Joy Robson, obviously, uh, what I was mentioning was in those books, they're telling the same exact story of when Victor Gutierrez approached her and told her about Michael Jackson, and she ended up telling on him to Michael Jackson's people, and Anthony Policano got involved with him. Um, huge problem with that. Uh, as far as the same checks concerned, here's what I found suspicious. I don't think Stephanie same checks so much. But I think the dad. You think the dad knew? I, I think the dad knew. Um, because there's this conversation about, again, going back to Latoya, a million dollar check made out to his father. What was that check for? Mm-hmm. It wasn't for the house that he bought them. It wasn't for the house because when they bought that house, that, that house was three hundred, a little around the area of $300,000. So why did he give this, this guy a million dollar check? You know, and I noticed that his father has no place in the documentary either. And there was something that I was reading, I think it was Victor Gutierrez's book, where he says the father didn't want to cooperate or the father didn't want to talk to him because he also tried to warn them about Michael Jackson. Uh, June Chandler, I just think June Chandler was just caught up in the moment. 
Mm-hmm. I don't think she really believed any abuse was going on. She wanted she wanted her son to be happy, and she she lost her way as a parent, not letting her off the hook, you know, because you know what happened happened. You get what I'm saying? I'm not looking off the hook, but I definitely felt like she got romanticized with the fancy trips, the shopping sprees, the nice jewelry. They they they, they, they all they all fell victim to it. They all fell victim to it, and they are in in ways complicit, mm. you know. So I definitely, I definitely consider it sort of compromise. Well, I'm going to read something from MJ Mythbuster. Remember, this was the late 80s and early 90s, a different time where there were, and still are, a lot of misconceptions about how pedophiles behave. They may have been awkward about the idea of their boy sleeping with Jackson, but Jackson act, Jackson's act was a pure, innocent sweetheart may have blinded them though i'm sure the money and celebrity and glamour didn't help yeah you know what that's a great point um mythbuster that uh you know we're even living in a we're living in a time we're living post me too movement right so that's another thing that makes us more aware of these kind of things happening but they didn't have access we have the internet now we have social media we have youtube we're able to go to websites and get, you know, the Michael Jackson case documents and, you know, transcripts from the grand jury. We're able to get this information that these parents really didn't have access to back then. They certainly didn't have the awareness that the Me Too movement, the Time's Up movement brought to them. So, you know, they, they're they living in a time where they take everything at face value. This person is a is a powerful celebrity he must be a good person he must be somebody who's responsible why would i doubt their word so i I would you know what that's a very important thing to keep in mind when looking at these mothers and seeing like you know why why would you put your child in that situation because and another thing that you you mentioned is that misconceptions about (coughs) excuse me about how pedophiles behave right um pedophiles we think of them as dirty old men with a unmarked white van right and um that's what a pedophile is not some young handsome pop star who loves to give to charity and visit children and and all that kind of stuff so there's there's that you know it completely different from what we in the past used to think of as a pedophile. Anybody else have anything to say about that before we move on to the next clip? Yeah, that was that would go back to what I was saying earlier. Like, I had a misconception of pedophilia. And I, I used to always think, like, it's just a choice or a lifestyle that people, like, I knew they were sick, but I always thought it was still a choice. But I think I had seen a um, Chris Hansen video where he caught this dude, like, literally back to back, like, the next day. And that, like, provoked me to look this up, like, look up pedophilia. And when I looked it up, it was like, their brains are wired this way. Like, how, like, when we see, like, for instance, if a male sees a female and she's, like, attractive, then it's going to send signals to certain areas, you know? And it's like, it says that their brain is, like, their wiring is, like, twisted. Like, it's, it's very different. Like, it's like the attraction for the opposite sex is replaced. So it's... It's natural for them. Like, it's not something they choose. It's actually, like, that's how their brain is wired. So it's like... Yeah, there's this doctor I, I want to interview as well. I can't remember his name's right. James Cantor. And he, he talks about that, that a pedophile... Most pedophiles tend to be born and not made. I mean, you have you do have people who are brought into a cycle of abuse, maybe because they were abused. But... Um, he he's a big believer in the idea that pedophiles are actually born and not made. And let me see, uh, MJ Mythbuster, your videos on how pedophiles behave really stunned me at how all the innocent, kind-hearted traits Jackson displayed were actually blazing red flags. Example, crafting his whole life around kids, philanthropy, hobbies, Neverland being a shrine to children and childhood never wanting to grow up. It wasn't just a fondness for children. It was an obsession. Yes, um, that that was news to me when I was able to research for that video. I'm like, oh my gosh, 
you know, pedophiles are nice. They're charming. They love spending time with children, even outside of a sexual context. They'll play with them. You know, this, right. this is every parent's dream for somebody to want to hang out with your child and babysit while you have work to do or whatever. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So the next clip I'm going to show is all right. Maybe we can move on from the, from the kids. All right. We're going to look at some clips of Jackson. And this goes into what you were mentioning MJ Mythbuster about how nice Michael Jackson is. He's just so nice and, um, you know, charming, but we're going to look at a clip of him, you know, being his charming self. I'm going to share my screen again. All right, I'm going to share my screen again and let's see. This is okay. All right, we're going to Michael Jackson sleepovers Diane Sawyer. So let's, I just want to, is it over? You're going to make, make sure it doesn't, doesn't happen again. again. I think this, this is really, is one thing, thing people want to know, that, that there are not going to be more of these sleepovers in which people have to wonder. Nobody, Nobody wonders when kids sleep over at last. But are they over? Are you, are you going to watch out for it? Now, watch out for just for the sake of the children and for no, everything it's all is all moral and it's all pure. I don't even think that way. It's not what's in my heart. So you'll, I will do it again. Ever. Do what again? I mean, you'll have a child. Of course. They want. It's on the level of purity and love and just innocence, complete innocence. If you're talking about sex, and that's a nut. That's not me. Go to the guy down the street because it's not Michael Jackson. All right, guys, what do you think of that? What do you think of that clip? Stop sharing. That's an insult to our intelligence. <laughs> yeah. What is he? Yeah, that clip, all right, I hear you. Uh, MJ Mythbuster says, I don't even think that way. Yeah, well, clearly he did, given the enormous amounts of pornographic books he had in Neverland. Yeah, he really presented- He was, he was very sexually aware, very sexually aware. Yeah, that's another thing that I, I, I would challenge the MJ supporters is that, you know, he puts himself out as someone who doesn't even consider um, sex, almost like an asexual person, right? Like his mind doesn't run that way. He doesn't think to se about sex, but yet, you know, he had all this pornographic material that even Tom Mesero is like, oh yes, Michael Jackson had hordes of porn, but it was heterosexual porn. So it's obviously showing that he's a heterosexual man interested in grown women, not a homosexual pedophile, right? So even Tom Mesero you know, admits that Michael Jackson, um, you know, had these, these, this pornographic material there. So yeah, so there he is port portraying it. Guys, I had some other clips, but they're lost. But anyway, we've been going for an hour and a half. I feel like this is pretty good. Anybody have any last thoughts before we close off from this? Um, I would like to say that like, I don't, me personally, I believe that he was guilty, but I, I still feel sympathy for him. Like, and that doesn't negate, like, I still feel like this should never happen to these children, but I feel sorry for him just because I know how mental illness, how strong it could be and how misconceptions, like, when you're wired a certain way, that's your nature. Like, that's something that you don't ask for when you come and you're, you know, and I deal with severe ADHD, like I said, and it, it's like, I don't have a problem with children, but the things that I deal with, uh, a lot of people around me, my family members, they, I, it's easy for them to not understand. Like, it doesn't make sense to them why I operate the way I operate, but 
I can see, like, it doesn't make sense to me either, but it's my nature. So it's like I'm stuck in the middle. Like, you know, not to, um, not no pun intended, but like, it's like I'm stuck in the middle, like, of how it can look on the outside and, and be dealing with it on the inside. So, and there's been times where I would cry and wonder, like, damn, why is, why, why do I have to go through this? Like, why do I have to operate this way? Why do I have to, naturally be this way and be stuck in it and it's like for him you know i remember you saying in one of your videos that uh when i, th I don't know whose mom it was but it was one of the victim's moms and they came to it they came to him about the situation he broke down in tears crying like repeating i would never hurt a child you know that kind of to me that looks like this is a man that like he doesn't believe what he's doing is wrong of course, he's aware that the public looks at it as wrong, but I feel like he believes, like, this is my nature, so how so? How could it be wrong? Like, you know what I mean? Like, and I feel like that crying and his response to the mom, like, that is like a... Coming from a genuine place. Where yeah, and I can tell he wonders, like, why am I... Why is my nature just so happened to be, like, this disgusting thing? You know, why does that fall on me? And like, well, I have to hide this because I don't think people will understand it. So yes, he does say stuff that it, uh, insults our intelligence and stuff like that, but I don't think it comes from an evil place. I think it comes from a, like, I have to lie because I don't think people would understand what, you know what I'm saying? And especially being rich and famous and having a different upbringing, like. I 100% understand what because even when I read through the books and things. Michael Jackson was a very lonely soul because, you know, he would have this connection with these kids, but then eventually these kids would outgrow him because, of course, they're naturally going to grow and mature. And eventually he, he couldn't relate to them anymore. So that's why he would move on to the next little friend, right? And then he'd have this connection with his child, which he knows is not going to last very long because once they're 14, 15, 16, I want to move on with being an adult. He's going to lose that connection. I, I think he was a very lonely person. I think that um, a lot of his behaviors kind of showed, even in the Martin Bashir documentary, even Martin Bashir has a lot of sympathy for how Michael Jackson is. Even when it came to his face, he's like, I understand why you would do these things to your face when your father would insult you and emotionally abuse you about how you looked. So I, I do feel that Michael Jackson was a very sad and a very lonely person. Um, that even in uh, the, the, the song, Childhood, right? Some of that comes up because he says, quote, no one understands me because I keep kidding around like a child would, right? He has that in the lyric. And I said, boy, you know, he, like everybody describes him as this man child. He's an adult, but he was psychosocially stunted to be at the level of a 12 year old, which is why he liked video games and playing tag, water balloon fights. He, he couldn't connect to adults to have adult relationships because he just couldn't he couldn't move past where he was mentally and i felt i actually do feel um sorry for it because you know <coughs> nobody's one-dimensional nobody's a one-dimensional monster right he did some horrific things he did horrific horrible things to those children but he was also a really messed up person and you can see it in even the way he disfigured himself you know from how he saw z what do you think? What do you think about that? Um, yeah, you know, I, I have in, in, in ways I do have I definitely do have sympathy for him because uh, a big reason is that uh, the enablers, the enablers around him, uh, let this get out of hand too, and that that starts with his mom, that starts with his dad, uh, you know, who lived there with him and knew what he was doing with kids. However, you think about it, they're like, well, he's the biggest breadwinner for this family. We might as well just let him do what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. And I watched the interview with Smokey Robinson, 
And Smokey Robinson said the biggest problem with Michael Jackson was he removed anybody from his life that would tell him no. He completely did it. Because you have to think, like, you, you inherit this power of celebrity. And it can be overwhelming. It's like, you mean to tell me I can do anything I want and not be held accountable for it? <laughs> Yeah, you know, and for some, and for somebody, and being sensitive, somebody who actually struggles with a mental problem as he did, that's uh, enabling is one of the worst things that you can do for him. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it, it, and, it, and it is tragic. And, and I'm not going to ever make the excuse that these kids deserve to be abused because there's nothing that says that they deserve the one ounce of that. Mm-hmm. But he, and not at all. And 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 he and he uh. But he, but he did manipulate, you know? He did use his celebrity. He used his money countless times. And there's, and again, there's so many kids that I know, I know there's some kids. Mm-hmm. You know, there's even an allegation, I don't know if you guys know, but there was an allegation prior to 93 that got covered up. Right. And I was, and I was putting myself like, that had to be somebody famous. That had to be somebody famous on the victim side of it. And I'm digging around on that, but uh, Michael knew what he could get away with, and he knew what that culture was in entertainment, because it's all over, you know. And that's what this is. What and this is, and in closing, I'm gonna say, what this is for us is not an attack on Michael Jackson. It's it's a challenge to learn how to get it right. Yeah. It's a challenge to learn not miss the clues. It's a challenge to protect children. Okay, exactly. that's what we should learn. We, we don't want to be. And, and, I, and I'll tell you the first, it's irresponsible to even give him a movie if you're not going to tell the right yeah. story. Yeah. It's, it's highly irresponsible. So so we have to learn as a society, like, look, this is what Michael Jackson was. All of you knew it. All of you need to come clean. All of us need to, to learn how to protect children going forward. You know, because the Jacksons, the Jacksons are in turmoil after his been in turmoil after his death. You know, because they, you know, what happens, whatever happens to Catherine Jackson with her getting up in age, you know, that that whole thing is going to explode and everybody's going to tell them. Yeah. MJ Myth Duster says there were so many things that could have led to something deviant the physical, psychological, emotional abuse of his father, being exposed to sex at a young age, having grown up as a performer too young, never having a childhood. Being a Jehovah's Witness, as well as being oh, a young boy. child prodigy um, in the music industry. It could be all those things. It could be none of them. We'll likely never know. Now, I do feel sorry for him. I just wish he'd recognize that he had a problem and got himself help. Same could be said about the drugs, the plastic surgeries, and so on. And you know what? I would even say Michael Jackson, you know... As a tragic figure, I think there was something in him that knew that this was wrong. Even if he tried, when you think about "Man in the Mirror," this you know um, lyrics like that, you know, I'm starting with a man in the mirror. Um, it it almost like he's subliminally telling us, "I know there's something wrong with me." You know what I mean? Right, but no, yeah, but, but the narrative is nobody's perfect. You know, it's just kind of like it ain't about being perfect. It's never life has never been about anybody being perfect. It's about it's about making an effort to do your best, and everybody's doing their best is going to look different, especially when you deal with a mental challenge. You know what right. I'm saying? That's when you deal with a mental challenge, it's going to be tough to do your best all the time. And wing tech. That's what I'm saying. Like the crazy part about it is, if you like take away the mental illness, he probably would be the closest thing to like, you know what I'm saying? Like a peaceful person to that person, and everybody wants to. Uh, emulate like close to Jesus Christ. Like if he didn't have, if he didn't have this mental illness, he probably would be that type of person. But absolutely, he's, absolutely, he's a good person with that mental illness, and it's like that's a crazy. It's very crazy to me because I believe like without it, I think he is a good. Like, I think he does have morals, but it's like okay, but you have a mental illness though. Like this is, and it's like this is what it looks like for a quote unquote good person. To have this like hideous, you know, like yeah. mental illness, like that's, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think he definitely did struggle with it. I think that he did feel like a freak or 
Like, you know, why am I so different? I think he did, but uh, he just couldn't uh, control those urges that he had. Hey, well, hey, guys, can I say this? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go oh, ahead. Just really quick. Okay, okay. And, and Jay Randy Terabarelli Ter Ter has an interesting piece in one of his interviews, and he, he said that uh, Michael did struggle with issues about his dad, and I, and I and my takeaway from the interview was that he already he he saw he saw his dad in him so much that the physical changes and then it was the person because Jay Randy Terabarelli said that whenever Michael would do something very shrewd, he would tell him that's Mary Joseph for you. <laughs> he said he would tell him that kind of thing. And I think that that's part, that's definitely part of, of, of Michael's mental illness was definitely tied to what his father was. I think deep down inside, he really loved his father. Yeah. But, you know, for the fact that what happened in that house in Gary, Indiana, what was going on in there, it's hard. It's hard. But I'm done. Well, guys, I want to thank you so much for turning up. And um, guys, thank you so much. This is this is just great sitting down and talking with you guys. We we went through a lot of different uh, issues here. And just thanks so much for coming out. Wintech, MJ Mythbuster, York, of course, Z, and um, everyone who came in before and now has to leave. But uh, thank you so much, guys. And... Uh, Everybody, I guess you'll he'll catch this on YouTube when I upload this. All right. But thanks again, guys. This has been great. Have a good one. All right. All right. Take care. Bye.